So welcome into the live stream today. We're going to be diving into crypto payments and also the impact of what crypto payments will circle around. And we're going to do that with an exclusive interview with Tyler Spaulding, who's the co-founder of Flexa. Obviously, you guys know that is AMP. We'll dive in deep to also what's happening within the AMP camp and dive into really kind of where the future of crypto payments might be going. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. As promised, we have Tyler Spaulding joining us today, who's the co-founder of Flexa. So I want to welcome him back onto the show. Great to have you back. Great to be here. Thanks to everyone. <clears throat> yes. So Tyler, let's just get into it. Obviously, we got a lot of questions. You know, it's interesting. When we do our live shows, uh, AMP is typically one of the most asked about tokens on our live streams. Mm -hmm. It seems like that one is just constantly... Uh, question: People are always wanting to know what's going on with it, where it's where it is right now. Let's get into a little bit about your current position. Uh, you, if I'm correct, you stepped down as CEO of Flexa. What does that mean for you? And where is the team going now with you stepping away from the CEO position? Sure. Um, so you mentioned uh, just now that you're talking about the future of payments, the future of crypto payments. Um, I fundamentally believe um, the future of crypto payments has never looked brighter, despite you know news or media to the contrary. Um, so this industry, what this looks like, the outlook, people using this, the size of the market and everything is only going to massively, massively increase. And so the thesis around all of that only looks brighter and brighter, especially when you look at it from a global scale. So what we've done now at Flexa, having, you know, such a great outlook um, of what we've been able to put together, the merchant network that we have, the PSPs that we've put together, the network itself, and then now AMP being a major component of all of that. We ended up having two really major pieces of this business. And so even for me, um, you know, previously as the CEO of Flexa, I'm having to, you know, really grow that network side. And then meanwhile, we're seeing now AMP itself um, and crypto itself. Um, you know, this is before... DeFi summer and yeah. everything now around just the explosion of crypto in general, that's gotten literally 10 to 100 times order of magnitudes bigger than it was. So now we're sitting here, we have this massively growing network and we also have the AMP project itself, which is also the opportunity around it is so incredibly massive. So we have this you know, multi-trillion dollar opportunity within payments and the network itself. And then now this, you know, this crypto project, which is also turning out to be something unbelievably massive and the opportunity around it. So we really have been looking at it for about the past year and a half, almost two years of how do we harness that? Um, seeing this and the growth behind both of these pieces. And so we just thought it made sense to really set up the foundation. I think I might have even commented at it last we spoke. Um, I try yeah. not, to, yeah, I try not to say things until they're really done. Uh, so that's a reason for it. It's not trying to be secretive or not talk about it, but it's kind of just our style and what we like to do. And so, so anyway, in seeing all of that, uh, we're at this crossroads of personally, as much as I'm, you know, very, very um, uh, passionate around payments and what that will, will solve. And I've loved what I've been able to contribute to the network. I've been in, you know, crypto for more than 11 years. And so seeing, bringing my knowledge and enthusiasm to that felt like a little bit more of a fit. Um, and then also, uh, Flexa has three other really great co-founders that have been there from the yeah. very beginning and a really, really strong team. And so we looked at it and we said, well, we, we can't let these opportunities go to waste. They're too, they're so big. So if I step into the Ant Foundation, really start leading the initiatives around that, growing the technology, the platform way beyond just as a token, all of the ideas we've been building up from the community and contributors of how big that could be, well, I could do that with a few of the folks on the team and not having to worry, have, wear both hats, which was just a little schizophrenic, to be honest, uh, trying to how we've navigated some of this of, you know, things are generally very mutually aligned, but at the same time, it's a very different strategic focus of how you grow one versus the other. Um, and then being able to, you know, leave Flexa in phenomenally great hands with um, our original, one of our original co-founders, uh, Daniel McCabe. So he'll be stepping into that role. He was previously the, the COO been there from day one, knows right. everything about the business, very perfect and easily aligned fit for us. And then, like I mentioned before, the other two co-founders, Trevor and Zach, still there, have executive roles. And so it's just in a really good place to sort of be able to keep that going at full steam. 
while I can then focus on something that still have equal passion for, but it's just so incredibly massive. And we just kept seeing it as, yeah, we really need to do this. Uh, and so it's been sort of in work for about 18 months or so. Uh, and now we're very, very close to unveiling all that and setting all that in motion, which is super exciting. So, so AMP Foundation, obviously, um, separate yet connected very deeply into what's happening with Plexa as a whole. What would be some of the key goals that you're trying to achieve with the AMP Foundation, I guess? And also, when you look at kind of the future of AMP as a token, I wanted to ask you a little later in the show, but I think this is credible now, is with the foundation being you, especially being at the helm there, what kind of initiatives would be some of the first things out of the gate that we could anticipate? Oh, yeah. So first, it's really evolving it from the token itself and as to, into a platform. So when you think about some of the limitations, so first it will be expanding its role as a collateral, use of collateral within as many different types of ecosystems as possible, Flexa being obviously one of the core and main foundational right. ones. How do we make that even better? So it will be a very distinct and separate organization. So there will be no ties or uh, interconnectedness with Flexa and AMP necessarily. Um, we could still work together, but they will be very separate and distinct organizations. And so on the AMP side, it will be uh, speed, cost, more ubiquity, ease of use, uh, the entire user experience, all these components, as well as decentralizing some of the other pieces around collateral managers and um, without going too deep into some of it, like how you can make that really, really easy, uh, allow it to be not only just from a user perspective, but integrate into various types of uh, hardware, software, other types of platforms, particularly at mm -hmm. retail, making it just very, very easy and even more decentralized. That's something we've had our eye on really from the beginning. And so those are things that will be rolling out very, very quickly from the beginning, because now we can just really focus on making that those pieces as absolutely good as possible. So Tyler, this is a good point. You kind of bring it up there in the sense of if we are going to see migration of the payment systems, as we see traditionally in retail today, the retail sectors, restaurants, you name it, uh, as well as online e-commerce. With When you look at the role of the AMP Foundation, the ability to kind of migrate over from what is a Web 2 stack over to a Web 3 and what we are seeing as the future of crypto payments, will the foundation be focused on that kind of transition between what we've seen in the technology front so far from the payment industry? I don't think um, AMP would be as much involved in the acceptance or any of the integration components around payments. It's really going to be in collateral managers or anything really behind the scenes of interfacing mm -hmm. within that those stacks. So we really okay. still want to be behind the scenes, right? Making this very, very easy. So again, it's almost like Users can go spend all these different assets from all their different wallets using any different type of platform. And then merchants can accept payments exactly the way that they have been for years and years and years. And right. everything just sort of looks the same and is super easy without any real changes. We don't want, that's like literally why it, sometimes it looks like a lot of what we're doing might seem a lot slower um, than it really is, is because we don't want to be making all these changes. We don't want to change consumer behavior or merchant behavior. And we're not trying to, really enforce any differences within the system. We want it to look exactly the same, feel exactly the same, and then work just at that exact level, but be a lot, ultimately a lot safer, faster, and cheaper for them, which yeah, we're seeing definitely. so far, which has been great. Yeah. Kind of working in the shadows there of where kind of the underlying yeah. connection. Yeah, it's really, and, and honestly, just not <laughs> as exciting sometimes, right? Like, you know, Flexa is to, to a large degree, just a standard fintech company. And so, and what yeah. it's doing and what it's building and behind the scenes and the integrations and the piping that we're all setting up in place, like that's just always not that exciting. It's a little bit boring, but that's great because we have this long-term vision of what this is turning into. And it's something that is so big and all the signs have just been so positive with the continued traction. I mean, we're still going for it. So it's yeah. looking really good so far, but it's going to be the, you know, the 15, 20 year overnight success likely, <laughs> how you'll start to see it in the well, accelerated and I, growth. Yeah, and I think a lot of people see this as a really kind of the entry point of where crypto payments are starting to shift. We're starting to see so much. We'll talk about Fed now here in a second because that, that potentially could have a big role in where this is mm -hmm. going in the future. I want to get back over to uh, some of the things obviously that have, have happened here in the news. 
The SEC targeting, uh, obviously there were several assets that were uh, hit. Uh, obviously that led to delisting. AMP was one of those. First of all, why do you think AMP was, was kind of pinpointed in on the SEC, from the SEC in terms of the list of assets that they wanted to look at for securities uh, scenario? And wh- how will this affect your role with the foundation? Are you gonna be dealing with the SEC directly? Oh man, there's a few questions in there. Uh, the first one, uh, I don't think we're sure um, why AMP was um, basically referenced uh, within that accusation. So just we're not we're not clear or sure of that yet. Okay. Um, and one thing also just to be very clear of um, that was really directed at a Coinbase situation, right? Mm-hmm. And an individual there. So all of the tokens listed were just mentioned as part of that accusation. So there really has been nothing filed or no cases or no action whatsoever against any of those nine projects mentioned. Um, And we haven't received anything regarding that. It's not, there's no investigations or otherwise to those projects. They were just mentioned as part of a different case. So just to be really clear on that, um, as people are mentioned, right? I think a lot of people, yeah, there's a lot of news out that insinuated that there was targets directly to these projects. You're saying that's not the case. Oh, not at all. Um, even when you read through the actual filing, it's a case that says, um, you know, we are filing a case against these, these two individuals, right? Mm-hmm. These people. And as a part of it, we're going to make these statements about these projects. But that's really yeah. all that it is. Um, there's no cases, there's no action, there's nothing else against those projects of any kind. Um, nor was there insinuated that there was. I think it's easy to maybe have some media or writing or otherwise about that, yeah. right? People can take that and make some headlines, but the pure factual reality is those nine products, to the best of my knowledge, um, there's nothing further. They were just mentioned in a case mm-hmm. regarding something else. Um, Are you, and so that, that is up, what it is. Yeah, does this open up the lines of communication with the SEC in any way for the AMP Foundation to possibly kind of circumvent any kind of potential issues down the road. Sure, sure. Um, at least, so the the great news too is on Flex's side. I mean, we've been full board everything we can really look at from the compliance side from day one as a money services business and growing our network. So we've been very, very active in all sorts of compliance from literally day one. And so, and now, uh, currently, I, I could mention that um, we, we have spoken to the F- SEC and we will be continuing on going that conversation more just so they have the best knowledge possible about what's going on, you know, in Flexa, what AMP is, um, and we'll see what might result from any of that. But right now, it's at least open dialogue, very positive, having discussions. We really want this sort of industry to thrive for everyone, right? So we want to do our best to make sure that regulators have the most information possible and the best we can contribute to that and see why it's also meaningful. Uh, And I think that that's going to go a long way. And I think people are starting to see that, especially with some of these DeFi projects that have really started to grow and where there's a lot of value in what's being put together within these crypto networks. And so if we can be a, you know, a piece at the forefront of that and lead to sharing more and more information about why this can be so incredibly powerful and valuable Um, that's great for us and we'll happily play a role within that. How do you see this affecting uh, the delistings that we saw obviously there with Coinbase, but also relisting uh, with AMP situation across many of the exchanges that are out there? Yeah, that's a, man, that is going to be so hard to tell, mainly because of, uh, I think the more macro environments and then, I mean, we're seeing not, as many token listings in general. And then mm-hmm. also, especially in the United States, uh, there's been what, four or five different pieces of proposed legislation around right. how these sorts of assets uh, will ultimately start to be regulated. I think that is really gonna be the much greater driving factor mm-hmm. rather than having any sort of focus on AMP or what we're doing. I think really the holistic, more macro effects are gonna be at the forefront of what that starts to look like even over the next, you know, three, six, nine months. I really think that's going to be the larger driver. So in terms of the implications of kind of a worst case scenario for AMP, you're saying the regulatory environment could be one of the big catalysts or potential pitfalls or challenges that you would have to face. Any other areas right now for AMP as far as being able to get back into <clears throat> the markets and into um, the general operating side? Yeah, so I would say that the yeah the larger sort of 
the entire ecosystem is really um, what to look at around just like listings and those sorts of things. So like, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, yes. Um, but then specific to AMP, it's really about when you look at worst case scenario for us, it's as long as there's going to be some level of liquidity in order to bolster the collateral of the token. So it's like utility that it has of being able to have enough uh, liquidity to be used uh, in the event of in putting it in these collateral contracts. As long as that is sufficient, you know, the network is going to keep working exactly as it has yeah. from day one. And, you know, we've looked at it so far. Um, the effects are still there. People are still using it. Spending is still occurring. Basically, the usage is exactly as before. We haven't seen any changes in terms of, you know, any real significant changes in terms of um, staking individual stakers, the amount staked, those sorts of things is perfect for us. And that's been really, really good because that's like the key indicator of health of the network. And now we can start moving into how do we make staking a lot easier and start using like um, the stake in place and the, the partitions within the token. I mean, we have literally millions of holders on other exchanges that we can now have them stake directly to the network. And we can do that in a very, very easy custody maintaining way. And that from the beginning is what we've been looking to set up. And so as we yeah. have that, we can now stake directly from exchanges, other accounts and the auditability of that is so clean. And so all of that is actually very, very positive to us. So from that perspective, yeah. we're still exactly straight um, what you've been looking at and what it looks like it can be. So, okay, so timing wise with what happened with the Coinbase situation, obviously the SEC highlighting AMP, which kind of caused a little bit of a waterfall effect on the, in the industry of looking at AMP. Um, we've seen some impact obviously on the token in terms of price. But in addition, uh, on July 5th, you guys talked about retracting away from the Gemini pay situation. So I was looking mm. at your, your tweet right here. It says, as part of your efforts to wind down Gemini pay previously available uh, in the app, staking rewards, et cetera, uh, will soon be removed from the flex of capacity. First of all, explain to me why move away from Gemini pay or, or was it a scenario of a technical situation or something that just didn't match up strategically from a roadmap side of things? Uh, um, actually, neither of those. Um, it's really just evolution of the platform. Um, so Gemini integrated the very first version of the API that we had ever really created as a very, very close partner. Um, okay. So that really isn't even being supported quite as much. Um, and oh, we've evolved in that into now the new uh, publicly released version of the SDK, which we're really, really expecting the the chronic soon, uh, but it really is actually soon, and it really is coming. And this is all part of the evolution. Um, we've tested it now live in two uh, fairly large public forums. So both uh, at Consensus uh, and then at the Futurist Conference in Toronto, uh, we enabled spending even with the native tokens so like the Desk token at Consensus and then the Uni token um, at uh, Futurist. And so powering the local commerce through those events, we had. Our SDK even now will enable, so we have the, the custodial payments and then also non-custodial ones, which lets any wallet with no integrations pay using Flexa. So okay. no previous integration necessary. So something like a MetaMask non-custodial wallet can be usable. And we've now demoed that twice uh, and it's worked very well from what we had expected on the back end. And so we'll now be opening that up publicly to let basically any wallet pay into Flexa directly, and then we'll have a revamped version of the SDK. So it was kind of a natural evolution of moving and evolving to the next version um, of the tech, which hopefully should be in people's hands very, very soon. <laughs> That'll be a huge, that's a huge uh, leap forward. You know, when you look at just the, the fact of interoperability, especially around payments and how wallet connections could really become somewhat of a barrier to entry for a lot of different entities, whether it's retail, you were mentioning a little bit about how events possibly could use it, as well as online e-commerce. When you look at all of that, this particular, uh, we'll call it version of what's happening with Flexa and AMP, this is being addressed right now and you're saying this is coming very soon. Yeah, uh, it's one of the, so these are the things, right? We like to we like to talk about things when they're done, and this is something that's just taken a very very long time to really put together. Now something that's much more universal that can apply. We've looked at all the various edge cases, all the different types of chains. When you look at um, 
like a great example. Uh, we can't go, oh, man, there's so much I want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, like, say it, when say you, it. When you look at, um, I mean, but even just thinking about it, when you look at a loyalty app, right? Because um, these are all the, the things that we've talked about, what mm -hmm. we want to enable, and really from the thesis from day one. We, we talk about integrating this into loyalty apps and now being able to spend loyalty points at your local retailer. Well, yes. those apps don't have all the features or functionality that we think really are taken for granted. So when you go to your, your um, airline or um, loyalty apps, do they have a scanner built in that would allow mm -hmm. it to interface with hardware? I don't think they do. Yeah. So yeah. you got to think about some of that, right? And so when you look at what, Flexa has been building for the past four to five years where we literally have the best in class scanning technology and decoding every sort of barcode and enabling that across all different types of phones, screen types, all different encoding schemas, all the different PSP provider hardware in the entire world. We're in a really great position to really bring forth a lot of these new technologies and integrate yeah. them in ways that we really haven't seen before. So these are all need to be part of a greater strategy. It's taken us a little bit longer. Everything always does, anything that's worth doing. Um, but so these are the things that we've really been thinking about because we, we know this industry very well. We know all the pieces. We're also working with these organizations from almost day one. So yep. we know what is needed. We know what needs to now taking place. We've gotten a lot of the signals that this is now growing. These things are needed. This stuff's all coming together. And so... Yeah, we're, we've built all of that, um, and it's you know in kind of the final stages of now getting this out there and having this all uh, hopefully have anywhere near anywhere near the opportunity that we expect um, will be super exciting. Yeah. The, okay. So you just hit on something to me, and we've talked about it here on our show many times when we do because we drill down into crypto payments a lot, and and loyalty feature sets are one that I think are going to be one of the breakthroughs of how blockchain will be integrated into some sort of payment system that would really make it easier for other platforms that have been around and are connected to all of these retailers. I can think of a couple of companies, one here recently that went IPO is Olo. Olo, who is tied to mostly online ordering through mostly food services, but they're getting into retail aspects as well. They connect a lot through the loyalty applications that circle around those industries the potential to possibly connect the dots of all that and make that a blockchain solution. Really what you're saying is that AMP is really kind of putting out a roadmap to be able to solve those problems, especially as it comes down to retail and crypto payments in general. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Right. We've looked at all these pieces because, and, and why that's critical, um, again, without going too deep into it, is that there needs to be ubiquity. That is why the existing payment networks and these pieces of plastic that are very, very insecure have done so yeah. incredibly well and consumers love them. They're usable everywhere. We really need to now take the advantage of where are those, where are those types of cards and those systems not? And how can you interoperate uh, globally between other countries and different formats and really build something that the technology now enables us to do that. And that's what we're trying to do. And so to, to realize the potential of what Flexa has, we need that ubiquity and we are looking at all these pieces because we need a solution that can integrate them all and make it really that seamless for a consumer to use whatever app, whatever assets they want. And right. it will look the same, again, feel the same. And that's very, very hard to do. Uh, and that's why we have a really great team doing it. Again, that's where, um, as we mentioned at the very beginning, now having Flexa and growing into those sorts of issues and then also uh, AMP and what it is then doing, these things are, are just bifurcated more. And the focus mm -hmm. of doing both of those things very, very well is just very hard. And so it's all sort of just the timing coming together very well for it. All right. So there, there has been some rumors, we'll call them that, that there was <laughs> complexity levels around the use case of Flexa within retail environments. We'll use Chipotle as an example where cashiers were not necessarily understanding. I've seen many of the videos, we've shown them on our show before, of Flexa being utilized in a retail environment. Is that true, one? And uh, when you look at complexity for retail and acceptance of payment, is there going to be a new model that we might see come about in the future? Or is this going to be using traditional, you know, merchant solutions, POS, et cetera, uh, to get these things done? That's a great question. I think it's going to be more the latter. Um, so again, that that 
confusion that you're mentioning that can occur sometimes um, is very, very vital to any sort of new payment system. And so Flexa has done a lot um, to use what's already there to sometimes our detriment because a lot of times people look at what we're doing and they think that it's really not novel or there isn't as right. much technology built into it because like, oh, it looks just like other things that we've seen. And we're like, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. That's very, very much by design. And That's we actually design. spend more time <laughs> doing it that way because when you look at someone like Chipotle and you say, all right, Chipotle, this is going to be great. What we're going to do is we're going to train all of your tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of staff on how to interact with these systems differently. It's such a non-starter. It just will yeah. never even come up in any sort of a conversation. No way. So what we've done is try to build, yeah, our solution, what looks very similar. So we can say, you know, pay with your phone, pay with a gift card, pay with a code, pay with a uh, coupon, pay with um, a loyalty card. All of those things generally are bucketed in a similar way with most PSP systems. And so... That's kind of how we leverage it to make it look the same to them. And then I'd say 90% of the time or more, that goes very seamless. It then works. They understand that. And then every now and then, especially because we have very enthusiastic people using this product, they'll say, I want to pay with Bitcoin. And they're like, I don't yeah. necessarily know, you know what that is. right? And then it gets into the question. <laughs> and I think that's where some of the challenges are coming from. Sure. But I do think that can also start to evolve because I think, or we hope, as more people are spending these things, they're going to start to realize, oh, all these other assets can actually be used as part of Flexa. And yeah, yeah. as part of that, I mean, we're even, oh, you know, thinking about, uh, I'll say just con- like conceptually, um, we're even kind of thinking about where payments are getting made. When you look at something like Chipotle, like most of their payments are even through their app anyway. They're order ahead mm-hmm. orders. They're using services right. like you mentioned earlier. So We even really want to be solving for that. The real answer is how do you embed this into the apps that people are already using? So it's not so much about I want to go into a restaurant and pay with Bitcoin. It's how do I just use Bitcoin in the app I'm already using and order ahead and you there you that's unlocking what this is gonna look like. And so that's what we've been focused on. So it's all part of a real universal solution, but Man, that is the sort of stuff that these other payment networks can't do. They don't do well. And this is also well, where exactly. crypto and these other yeah. assets. Exactly. So that's, you know, you got it. But you have to get the ubiquity is so critical. You have to really yeah. get this out there. See people using it. Learn from where some of that friction is. And then just keep charging hard. But really go for the big, big opportunities. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. So is Flexa still connected with Chipotle today? And Absolutely, if so, yeah. All right, so how has that been working? Has there been an uptake in terms of volume? Have you guys seen continued, you know, really adoption from an aspect of retail user use to actual point of sale? Um, Sort of both. Uh, It's a little bit of a mixed answer. So the first one is that uh, that integration is one of our proudest ones and that it was something that required quite a bit of um, sort of custom work uh, with our partner on that in enabling that which now could be now usable across the entire portfolio of merchants that that use that software which is phenomenal to us so that integration itself was a part of a very very large partnership which we're really proud of um and so that part of all the technical work and what has gone on and working with chipotle specifically is as a plus it couldn't be happier with the way that all of that has really evolved and what the future looks like and where we'll be integrating this further so and then that said um i'd say there's been moderate use because it's still been limited around the open access of not only our sdk public access and then any wallet and those are the things why we're working so hard to get those out the door quicker uh because i think the enthusiasm and just the awareness around this happened a lot more quickly than we expected so yeah. we're a little playing catch up and getting that ready and that's where i keep mentioning it earlier it's going soon it really is there's a there's just a lot to do it right where a lot of companies will take the you know approach of we're gonna go fast and break things which is a great great startup mantra but we're a money services business you know licensed to do business this is people's money and we do not We've never taken the stance of we're going to do things and ask for forgiveness later or not do things the right way. And then more importantly, to all of our users and our partners, 
To date, we have not lost one dollar anywhere within our system due to fraud, vulnerability, hacking, theft, or otherwise, and we want to keep it that way. And that, that is really that in something itself will be huge. Yeah. That that yeah, we that don't get credit for right that. there. <laughs> right? Unbelievable like the, because you know the amount yeah. of, of impact we see in the merchant services side in terms of just fraud and and that. If if we circumvent that, the cost to retail services is gonna it's gonna absolutely bottom out, which I think will be one of the key features of how the future of crypto payments are going to be uh, really executed. Tyler, so I want to get into uh, Fed now uh, because I, I feel like this has a lot to do with where and what the mission of AMP, especially the foundation, but also Fex, uh, Flexa as a tool are going to be integrated. Uh, just on this news, Fed, uh, Fed expects to launch the long-awaited faster payment system. This is happening by 2023, which I was kind of surprised that 2023 would be a date for this. What are your thoughts on Fed now, and how will this essentially affect the future of crypto payments as we see them today? Um, yeah, I mean, it was exciting. So it'll probably be, I don't know, mid-2024, mid 2025 by the time it, it launches now, given the 2023 date. <laughs> uh, but yeah. we're actually really excited about it, and me personally, because that's going to augment what Flexa is doing it, uh, in a very, very profound way, because Right now, any sort of digital payment system, anything that uses uh, sending asset, like that's all great to what Flexa is. That's literally the reason that Flexa exists. What Flexa is bringing to the market, we need other types of supplement tools. So even right now, the, the great analogy would be um, you have ACH payments um, in the United right. States. So we already have slow bank payments in the United mm -hmm. States, but we cannot use them at retail for a lot of different reasons. So even though we have this tool, their acceptance, like the acceptance piece of being able to use them at hardware or online or otherwise, that's really where the vulnerability is of how do you take these assets, these tools or the settlement platforms and use them practically. So that's what Flexa does. Flexa is the how do we enable these things to be usable practically? And so having something like FedNow would just be another component of the network. Now, we would then say, if this system works very well, we could say, look, you can now use this as a, as a merchant, user, or otherwise, and now we'll integrate it into retail, and make it very easy. So a merchant doesn't need to know how to interact with all these other systems. And then more importantly, when you use Flexa, one of the big values is you get everything else too. So it's not that, oh, I have to now make some separate integration for FedNow or something else. And then I have this other integration. Then I have um, the, a Bitcoin integration or I have a Lightning integration. And then I have all these uh, credit card integration. With Flexa, it's, there's one and you can get all these assets getting filtered through it and make it very easy for you. So with us, it would just be one other component of what we're doing. And we would be super excited about it for something like that to exist. So you see this as a good uh, next step of integration into the payment, you know, rails, so to speak, of what we're seeing, you know, especially from the, the proposition of Fed now and what they're trying to do, especially from the ACH side, as well as traditional payments, you see this all as a positive right now for crypto. Absolutely. Massive, massive positive. The more okay. of these sorts of systems exist, absolutely the better. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think in terms of regulation? Because obviously we're going into midterms, a lot of new Political positions have started to look at crypto as kind of a, a stump position in, in, the, in the essence of it's now within their uh, portfolio of things that they talk about to their constituents. Do you think this is coming in this next cycle of elections, not only midterms, but our next presidency? Where do you think that uh, will play? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, having been involved from the, the very beginning, it's interesting to see this growing enough to where people care because uh, yeah. you know it's been years years and years of oh you know what we're doing and, the, and you know asset prices and market size and everything else it's been so trivial right it's never yeah. been able to even come close to make it to a main stage that so even the fact that we're even at this point talking around this is pretty exciting of, okay this is getting real now and it's showing that there can be economic benefit to this and now we do need to figure some of this stuff out uh it's uh, the political angle is always really challenging because um, regardless of where you stand, I'm always a little surprised that it's not more, um, especially in the United States, not more of a bipartisan support. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like, because again, crypto cannot be defined in one like 
isolated way. There's lots of different features of what it has. It has, you know, currency-like features. We talked about security-like features, as money-like features. It has all these features that can be used in different ways that I'm really surprised that both sides really haven't picked up on that and picked yeah. the pieces that they really, really can benefit from. You know, on the, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of criticisms on, you know, more of the left side. And, and for me, that's been frustrating of, well, this can really promote open access, uh, mm -hmm. underbanked, um, uh, less regulatory issues around people getting access into this system. And so it really does benefit um, everyone in terms of like um, inclusion at a much greater level than I think we've ever seen any sort of technology. So that I'm surprised isn't getting more uh, sort of endorsement or like at least discussion around. Um, yeah, I don't think they understand either, that completely just yet. Yeah, it was a little it's, frustrating. It's like, wow, this is wide open for you. I'm, I mean, when I see some of the criticisms, I just think, wow, this is a tool that really is aligned with what you believe. Like this should. Mm -hmm. So I guess all of that said, uh, either way, it's now gotten to a point where um, our industry and what we're doing in digital assets and these technology is getting so big that regardless of you know who ultimately wins or has control or otherwise, it'll be something that hopefully can get um, you know dealt with positively, and there'll be very positive regulation. I think people are recognizing that keeping the technology, the growth, the ecosystem growth is valuable. It's not something that you want to shut out, um, and so hopefully maybe it's going to be an iterative process. But again, the more companies like Flexa that are showing why this can be very meaningful in a, in a multi-billion or trillion dollar industry and how this will really start yeah. to change things to make this more equitable for everyone. I think that's a pretty universal point. And I think we're seeing support on both sides um, and who we've talked to so far of understanding what Flexa can do in addition to other companies using this technology. I think that's pretty, that's pretty universal. So, yeah. You know, we'll see uh, where we end up, you know, in a few more months from now and what it literally looks like. But my optimism is that it's big enough now that people are starting to realize enough of the pieces that will hopefully, yeah. again, continue on to a state that will really foster the innovation and the growth, even well, if we and, have a few stumbling blocks. Yeah. And I think you're getting enough uh, integrations now into real world use cases. When you look at just the initiative Fed now, among many others across, including the EU, you look at what's happening in Asia, there are many different systems that are really starting to integrate more and more digital uh, payment systems, which obviously will have a uh, seepage effect into a lot of the crypto community as a whole. Uh, I wanna hit you on the last question here on a couple of things in terms of the titans of the payment systems out there. You look at XRP, obviously uh, more of a global uh, payment uh, messaging system, kind of uh, really designed to replace SWIFT. And then you look at uh, the Lightning Network, which really rides for uh, Bitcoin and the potential of executing on payments for the use case of Bitcoin. Those two platforms, how do those align up with what AMP and Flexa is doing? Do you see this as kind of a crossover, something that's competitive? Where do you see the landscape? Because to me, those are very interesting payment landscape elements. And obviously, Flex and AMP fall right in the middle of those. Yeah, I think... Um... At a high level, both, so uh, Lightning Network, much more so, is something that, so not only have we already integrated that um, into Flexa, right? So as part of our mm -hmm. El Salvador initiative, working with the yep. largest banks there, enabling Lightning payments. And so uh, I believe that things, scaling solutions or other projects like Lightning will be very valuable to Flexa, and we will continue working with them as being a vital piece of our overall infrastructure. So I think that absolutely makes sense. Um, something like what Ripple offers of what I'm familiar with isn't really as connected to Flex, although a little, sort of a little bit more of like on the FedNow example to where it could right. be valuable uh, to certain merchants or, or banking partners. Um, so a little bit less so. Um, Ripple's product just doesn't overlap quite as much as us, being very, very focused on retail payments. Um, yeah. But it could. Um, uh, so there's still at least some level of partnership opportunity, depending on how this grows, especially internationally, for us to start to be able to move money around um, between jurisdictions, like something like RippleNet might be super helpful to us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that would just need to be evolved. Um, and on the Lightning side, again, very positive because I'm the, 
I'm at least a believer. Um, so being a, a very, very strong Bitcoin advocate, by the way, I just don't see a world where lightning payments, uh, at least pure native lightning payments on Bitcoin really make sense at a retail level, at a large retail level. We're talking, you know, you know medium or bigger yeah. businesses yeah. because you need all the integration work. You want all different types of assets anyway. Um, there's all sorts of complexity around um, uh, running lightning nodes and how that's ultimately going to get, um, uh, you're going to need licensure for that. And it'll be very easy for, you know, government to just say, oh, well, you just can't accept lightning payments unless they're through a uh, licensed operator, right? Of things yeah. like that, right? And so that's fine. Um, you know, I have opinions both ways on all of that, but that's again, what Flexa does is that we're like this adapter that allows these nodes, or these layer twos now make payments in through our integrations and then everything right. will still look the same to a user. So an end user has a lightning wallet, can literally go, you know, deposit funds into their Banco Agricola account in El Salvador. They can pay their bills. They can, um, they can actually take out loans, I believe now. They can buy online uh, through their online payments, uh, e-commerce, all using Flexa now. And it just looks native to them. They're using their yeah. lightning enabled wallet. And that's how we want to have this all come together. Well, I mean, obviously the other aspect to that is the MSB, obviously with money services business licenses uh, around the use case of many of these platforms. We'll probably see more and more of that really kind of play into the landscape as a whole too, which will get back to the point of maybe other payment systems. It'll be interesting. Could Flexa be maybe the leader here? At least right now, the, the research that I've done, Flexa seems to be one of the key leaders around this shift toward uh, moving to more more retail payments on this system. So interesting stuff for sure. Um, we've got a, a poll coming in and then a couple of questions I wanna get here from our audience. All right, so how long until we see a clear crypto payment regulation? Uh, we've got 46% saying 2024 plus, 2023, 36% and this year not gonna happen. And then government will crack down more 12%. So it looks like 2024, kind of to your point, that seems to be kind of the potential of where this cracks open. Do you think that with what our audience is kind of leaning into and what you've said today, you think it's more from a regulatory standpoint or more of an adoption standpoint from both retail and the merchants themselves? Um, I think a lot of it goes hand in hand. Like all the, you talk about a lot of institutions or big banks, right? not be involved in this stuff because there isn't the right. clear regulatory approach, right? Like large, it's the, it's the perfect, perfect example around like, um, uh, like cannabis use in the United States and that you have it legal in certain States, but it's not federally legal. So a lot yeah. of the largest banks won't bank cannabis companies, even though they're, they're legal in certain jurisdictions because they have licenses across the entire United States. They can't jeopardize losing all of their licenses by banking mm -hmm. a company out in Colorado, which is why you only get regional or intrastate banks that are banking cannabis companies because they don't have the yeah. liabilities or their exposure isn't quite as large. I see that exactly with crypto. So I think that it's a little bit of both sides of the more and more adoption sort of as we're seeing now encourages the legislation because now they realize this is big enough and this means something and wow, this isn't gonna go away. Much like e-commerce, in the you know late 1990s, the U.S. was man without going into whole history was beside themselves at how in the world are you ever going to regulate online interstate commerce? That yeah. was the big thing <laughs> around. So they created tax nexus laws, right? Yeah. And but before they did that, they put um, basically a, a moratorium, and there was basically like a 10 year or 12 year period where it was like exempt. It was like kind of grandfathered in as like we are going to figure this out. And even something with the growth of e-commerce and where people eventually realized, wow, this is going to be transformative, it still took over 10 years to really figure out and get to a state where everyone was playing in the level, you know, level playing field, everyone getting happy with it, how it all worked, the states collecting the revenue that they felt was just all of that. And now it's really not talked about anymore. And it's yeah, sort of what exactly. I call it solved. But right, but that was the biggest issue. How in the world we're going to shut this down? How are we going to tax this? How is interstate commerce ever going to work like this? This is a disaster. And so yeah. what they did is say, all right, well, we'll put a pin in it. We're going to let all these businesses continue to operate. We're going to figure it out. And again, it's a government, so they're designed to move a little slower. 
they eventually ended up with a state where everyone now is very happy yeah. and it's thriving, right? No one complains right now, at least <laughs> not that I hear of. Wow, yeah. e- internet e-commerce would be phenomenal if it wasn't for those state taxes. Now it's it's yeah. figured out. So I yeah, view it right. exactly the same as what we're seeing now is that as people now use all of this, legislation is going to catch up. They just need to understand it. It's going to take a few more years. Maybe 2024 is exactly where we're sitting. And then as yeah, that we'll sort see. of gets figured out, then you're going to see just this absolutely like um, huge off. shifts in you. Exactly. Yeah. Because now everyone can use it comfortably. All the tech can come in. The big players can come in. And that's a benefit for everyone. So, yeah, for sure. yeah it's kind Couple of, the, of yeah, they, they're too related. A couple of questions sure. here. One coming from Amp Knight. Uh, Fed is rolling out with Fed now. Flexa goes. Uh, w- will Flexa go live with wallets before Fed now is released? And any SDK updates? Uh, so yeah, especially given uh, the proximity on our side and the Fed now will probably take considerably longer. Without no, no disrespect to that, uh, so it will sure. be definitely out before then. Um, and yeah, the SDK update, uh, we will be publishing all of the information around that very soon. Full details, all the documents, what all this looks like, when it is ready, we will absolutely put it all out there, but it is nearing completion. Yeah. And then another question here, uh, do you have any association or have you talked with the FedNow team? Uh, not that I'm aware of yet, although some of the people involved, there's a lot of so I'd have to look sickly and up of and who they're, where the overlap is. Um, so potentially we have spoken to some of the people involved, but not officially yet. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Listen, uh, Tyler, it's always fun talking to you and thank you again for coming on today. Cause I think this cleared up a lot of questions, not only from our audience, hopefully out there into the interwebs of people really understanding what's happening with AMP as a whole. And obviously the initiatives of what Flexa is doing. So it's always great to get a a top level executive to really kind of break some of this stuff down. But we appreciate you coming on to the show and answering our questions today. Uh, and thanks a lot. We'll catch you next time for sure. Of course. Yeah, love to do it. Thank you. <clears throat> you bet. All right. So you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Uh, make sure and jump over here to the live streams on YouTube because this is where you're going to catch all of this alpha, a lot of our breaking and CEO, breaking news, as well as our CEO interviews, our uh, lead executive interviews. All of that happens right here on the YouTube channel. And it's easy to do. All you have to do is search Paul Barron Network. You'll find us, like a couple of videos, but the number one thing you have to do is hit subscribe and make sure and click that little bell because it is going to give you notifications of when we do a live stream like this so you don't miss exactly what we're talking about today around AMP and Flex. A lot of that uh, easy to find. If you guys want to catch me, it's out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.